Thank you and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about possible effects of climate change on natural and agricultural systems. Uh, before I get into some specifics, <coughs> excuse me, of what kinds of effects we might expect to see, I want to just give an overview of, of the approach I'm taking and the question I will address and what I will not do. So the basic question is, will plants, both native plants or vegetation and crop plants, be sensitive to the level of, and rate of climate change that we are experiencing now and are likely to continue to experience in the future? Because of the uncertainty in how precipitation range right, regimes will change, especially in uh, dr fairly dry places like California, we cannot make specific predictions about how the climate will change, and in turn, we cannot make specific predictions about he how ecosystem will be affected, particularly at the local level. However, we can, through various kinds of studies, evaluate the sensitivity of these systems, which will give us an indication of whether they are likely to change in some ways when climate change. And so the caveat is don't take the examples, the forecasts, the predictions that come from models literally, but take them seriously. So we can't believe very specific projections, but we can, from these studies, understand that the systems will be sensitive. So let me talk, say a few things about the general importance of climate for ecosystems and agriculture. Ecologists and uh, naturalists have known for centuries that climate is the most important factor determining where native plants and vegetation occur and where agricultural uh, crops are grown, although this can be dramatically modified by irrigation so that they can dry, uh, thrive in very dry places. So we also know that the earth the climate, there are climate zones of the Earth, and in general, it gets colder from the equator as you go to the poles, and it gets colder as you go up in elevation. So as climate warms, we will expect that climate zones will shift poleward in latitude and up in elevation. In order to survive and thrive, native species will have to shift their distributions by spreading to new areas where the climate is still suitable for them. Species that remain in place will either grow less due to stress or may gra gradually dry out. And the same principles can apply to agricultural crops, although farmers may have ways to adapt to that. So uh, next slide, as it says, I'm gonna talk about some examples of agricultural effects. So, the next slide shows an example of how climate change might affect fruit production in several important, uh, agriculturally important tree species in California. So this, what this shows is the number of, uh, uh, is how the, how the de decreasing number of cold periods and cold temperatures in the winter might affect these crops. So these three species, almonds, apples, and walnuts, require a certain amount of cold during the winter before they can successfully flower and produce fruits uh, in the growing season. And this shows uh, how, ch those, how the cold, the chill hours, as they're called, might change in three different areas in the Central Valley, Davis, Fresno, and Red Bluff. And the shaded part of this slide uh, near the bottom, which is hard to see, um, shows the, the requirement for chill hours for these three species. And it's just under about 2,000 uh, hours per year. It's below some temperature. I don't know if it's freezing or some other temperature. I don't even remember, and it's not shown on this slide. But the green bar shows the, the number of chill hours that, that uh, were typically on average uh, experienced between 1961 uh, and 1990. And you see it's well above the requirement for the plants. But the yellow bar and the orange bar show the number of chill hours that might be expected 
under both a low warming range and a moderate war warming range. And we're not showing results for a high estimate of how much the temperatures might change. And what you can see is that uh, under the moderate lo lower warming range, it becomes uh, the, the plants uh, barely experience enough chilling. And under the medium warming range, they don't experience enough hours. And so plants that experience this would not be able to fruit uh, and produce the nuts and fruits that uh, they normally would. Uh, in the next slide, I show a different kind of example. It's sort of an indirect effect of climate change. This shows um, what parts of California are currently suitable for the cotton pink bollworm, an important pest of cotton, and uh, where it might occur in the future under a lower warming range of about 4.5 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And so you can see that under current conditions, it's only in the southeastern part of California and a small area in the southern San Joaquin Valley where the uh, cotton pink bollworm uh, can, it, where it's a suitable uh, habitat for it. But once the climate warms a little bit, the potential range for this species and where it can affect the cotton increases dramatically through the entire Central Valley and coastal California, south, uh, Southern California. So those are just two examples. And, uh, uh, one other uh, somewhat different uh, problem that I want to address is uh, the water for agriculture. And so this slide uh, uh, summarizes some of the problems that we're going to be facing as climate warms. California agriculture now depends enormously on irrigation, mostly from the Sierra and snowpack. And our current dam and reservoir system depends upon the slow release of water from the snowpack as it melts through the whole summer um, to provide a slow supply to the dams and so they can then gradually release that water. With warming, much more of the precipitation will come as rain and any snowpack will melt faster due the, to the higher temperatures. And the current dam and reservoir system simply can't hold all the water at once. It depends upon its slow release from the snowpack. So there no longer will be enough water for a full gr uh, growing season. No longer will the full amount of, of precipitation that falls be able to st be stored and then distributed over time to the agricultural sector. Uh, much of it will be, have to be released early in the summer or, or in the spring, even in the end of winter, uh, to make room for more water as it comes in and will be unused for agriculture and, and go out to sea. So basically there will be less water for agriculture and for other human uses. Okay, now I'm going to turn to effects on vegetation distribution as the title here on this slide shows. And the next slide uh, shows you the current distribution of vegetation. Uh, this is a map of vegetation types typical of uh, many that have been done for all parts of the world for many decades by ecologists and naturalists. And so this just shows one somewhat arbitrary list of different kinds of uh, vegetation and so we're talking about things like grassland or desert vegetation with uh, cacti or conifer forest, chaparral, oak woodland, etc. And uh, basically, climate variation in temperature and precipitation caused by latitude in California, elevation, and distance from the ocean determine the present distribution of natural vegetation. And so as climate changes, we'll expect uh, vegetation zones to move around. So the distribution of these colors will change uh, depending on exactly how climate changes. So this next slide shows some uh, projections from one model uh, over uh, for, for 1990, or approximately the current situation, and then for the year 2020, 2060, and 2100. And we mainly want to look at the differences between uh, 1990 and 2100 because those are the most dramatic. And you can see that there are uh, quite dramatic changes. Um, uh, one interesting one is that the amount of uh, 
uh, sort of counterintuitively, the amount of desert scrub, uh, according to this model, decreases. And uh, I'm not exactly sure why that is, because I don't know enough about the specific model, but it's very possible that it's because this model incorporates changes in fire regime, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, and if fires become very frequent, as often as every year, uh, uh, perennial plants, especially shrubs and cacti, won't survive, and they'll be replaced by grassland. And that's what's being shown uh, in the eastern, southeastern area of California in this comparison. The, the most dramatic change, I think, is what you see in the decline in the amount of uh, light blue and dark blue, which are alpine meadow and subalpine forest. And these are, if you've been up into the high Sierra, these are very beautiful areas. And uh, uh, what we see here is that that kind of habitat, especially um, above pim tim timberline, subalpine or alpine meadow, will essentially disappear uh, sometime in the next century. <clears throat> the next slide shows some changes, possible changes in vegetation distribution just within San Luis Obispo County. This was done as part of a study for, uh, uh, I think, the county. And uh, the kinds of vegetation aren't particularly important here. It's different from that previous slide. So these are vegetation types that just occur in, uh, in this area. But it includes things like maritime, evergreen, needle leaf or conifer forest. Uh, temperate shrubland, subtropical shrubland, and others. Um, and because I don't want you to take any particular change literally, uh, I'm not going to dwell on what these different colors mean. But what you can see is going from uh, uh, the, the current distribution of vegetation to these periods of 2035 to 45 and 2075 to 85, um, that there are significant changes. Um, the, the bright green, which is the maritime evergreen forest, actually disappears in all these scenarios. These columns are different climate change models that predict different things. A cautionary note here is that the little cells for the predictions, or the squares that you see on the map, are probably about 10 kilometers on the side. And if you think about the vegetation in the mountains, around here, and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, um, you see many of these different kinds of vegetation within a few hundred meters of each other, and that kind of variation is completely lost in this uh, projection. But the important point here is that the vegetation within our, our, uh, our county will be sensitive to climate change. Uh, this slide uh, looks at wildfire frequency, and I, I mentioned that a little while ago. <clears throat> and it shows the probability of a large wildfire of more than 200 hectares, with uh, the green being about a 0% probability, and the dark red being as high as 25% chance per year. <clears throat> and you can see that uh, going from a uh, uh, the current conditions, historical average, to a lower warming range and then to a warming, uh, a medium warming range, there's a pretty dramatic increase in the probability of large fires. 11% in the lower range and 55% in the medium range. And if we experience a high range, it'll be even higher. And you can see that it uh, certainly affects our area. Uh, and that's not surprising. And this slide shows uh, a plot of acres burned uh, since 1950 for the state of California. And the red line shows the amount each year uh, during that 60-year period. And you can see that, that it looks like it's starting to go up since about 1990. Um, the, gray, the dotted gray line is the five-year running average where they each year they average the previous five years and plot that. So it tends to smooth out the extremes, but you can see that that shows the increase in the last uh, couple of decades even more dramatically. And so what this is essentially showing 
is, uh, uh, this is the common way of describing it, is the signal of an increasing wildfire frequency emerging from the natural noise that has always, always been there. So let me turn now to what I call threats to biodiversity. So vegetation, those are conglomerations of a lot of different plants that grow together in one area. So there are lots of different species of grass and grassland and lots of shrubs in the chaparral, et cetera. So uh, here we're talking about actual uh, individual species. So we're talking about species, bio, uh, species diversity and how it might change. And so there are some general, generalizations we can make uh, about where, in what kinds of situations, suitable habitat for a particular species might disappear. The first is the poleward tips of continents, which is sort of a mouthful. And uh, so let me show you what I mean. So all the continents obviously are defined uh, because there's ocean around them. And, and so at the poleward ends of the continent is where we're talking about. So we're talking about across uh, northern Europe and Asia where it meets the Arctic Ocean and the same for North America and, and Greenland. And then the southern hemisphere, we're talking about the southern tip of South America, the southern tip of Africa, and uh, especially the southern uh, 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 border of Australia. Essentially no plants, uh, or almost no plants, grow in Antarctica, so uh, we're not talking about that, although more will in the future. So these areas are problems for biodiversity because if climate zones shift poleward, then the climate zones that currently exist at the northern ends of the continent, continents in the northern hemisphere and the southern tips in the southern hemisphere uh, will essentially shift off of land. Those climate zones will be out in the ocean. There won't be any place for the plants that pre previously grew on land in those climates uh, when, when those zones shift. But there's a big difference between the northern and southern hemisphere because in the northern hemisphere, these, these poleward edges of the continents are already at a very high latitude. And so we know that they have pretty poor floras and, uh, and to some extent faunas. So across that region, the, at the edge of the Arctic Ocean, it's tundra, it's Arctic tundra. And that extends quite a ways uh, inland in, in uh, all those areas. And so although, and, and so Arctic tundra may be threatened. It might eventually disappear um, and be replaced by Boreal forest, which is conifer forest that you now find further south. And uh, so uh, in that case, we, we won't lose as many species just because the flora is already pretty poor in species diversity. It will still be a problem, it will still be unfortunate, but the species diversity isn't that high. It's very different in the southern hemisphere, especially in South Africa and southern Australia. Uh, South Africa, the very tip, a fairly small region, is one of the most floristically rich areas in the entire world. And all of the species there occur nowhere else in the world. And so if the climate changes the way we expect and warms, then many of those species will go extinct unless they're simply preserved in botanical gardens and things like that because it'll be too hot and dry for them to grow in South Africa anymore. And Southern Australia is also quite diverse, and so the same problem will happen. In South America, it's a little more like the, uh, that extends quite a ways further south, and so it's a little bit more like the uh, Northern Hemisphere, but still there will be losses there. A second uh, kind of habitat where uh, plants and animals will have problem are alpine habitats. And it's for the, exactly the same reason. Um, this is an example of, I don't know if this is the Rockies or Sierra, but again, this is basically above timberline in a high mountain region in, in the U.S. And uh, it's a popular area to hike and camp, uh, backpack, and it's very beautiful, lots of wildflowers. And so that's the kind of habitat we're talking about losing. And the next slide shows this uh, 
sort of cartoon of, of what we're talking about, um, uh, about high risk species that are located already near the tops of mountaintops. And so on the left you see uh, hypothetical zonation of two different species that are adapted to different climate zones on these mountains under the present climate. And then we have a warmer climate and basically it shows that the suitable habitat for species A no longer exists. exists. The, the, the mountains would have to go higher if species A uh, was going to survive. And species B is now confined to just two peaks, a uh, much smaller area than it existed before. And so that's the problem uh, in mountain ranges for species diversity. Uh, a couple of others for which I don't have uh, slides. Um, uh, one is coastal wetlands. Uh, coastal wetlands occur in many areas around the world and uh, uh, can be quite rich in species diversity of plants and animals. Uh, they can be very important uh, uh, breeding grounds for fish and uh, very important for uh, 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 marine birds, uh, nesting places and for birds. Um, and uh, as sea level rises, uh, coastal wetlands will get inundated and the level of the ocean will be too high for them to survive and so they'll gradually disappear and if if climate was changing very slowly and if humans uh, weren't on earth yet then coastal wetlands would gradually reestablish inland but because humans have dramatically changed coastlines around the world and it's a, a place where millions billions of, of humans live and inland from coastal wetlands is usually uh, communities and roads and uh, agriculture and all sorts of things. There isn't any place where the coastal wetlands be, will be able to go. So many uh, species of coastal wetlands will be threatened. Um, and then there are uh, species that are of plants that are adapted to certain soil types like limestone and serpentine. Uh, and uh, uh, we have lots of uh, serpentine outcrops and serpentine soil in San Luis Obispo County and you can see it very easily on roads in the country and out towards the airport uh, in San Luis Obispo. And the interesting thing about uh, uh, some of these unique soil types is that their chemistry is such that uh, only certain plants can grow on them. So you have entirely different plants that grow on, on serpentine soils than grow uh, a few feet away on sandstone soils or more normal, normal soils. And so if the climate changes, these plants are adapted to uh, serpentine habitats in a particular climate zone. If the climate changes, then these plants will have two problems. Number one, they can only survive if there's serpentine in the climate to which, uh, in the climate zone where they which has now moved farther north, for instance, in the northern hemisphere. And uh, uh, so if, if they don't exist farther north in the northern hemisphere, then there isn't any place that they can go and they'll go extinct. But even then, serpentine uh, outcrops and soils are patchy and so they can be some distance apart. And so the plants will have to migrate uh, to those areas without suitable habitat in between. The next slide lists another set of uh, somewhat different kinds of threats for biodiversity. Uh, uh, one is the, uh, and most of these have to do with uh, uh, the, uh, human activity. One is that uh, uh, human caused land use change may have eradicated certain kinds of uh, habitat uh, that would be suitable for these plants under climate change, but isn't there anymore. And so that's a problem. And of course, humans have fragmented natural ecosystems with roads and communities and agriculture. And that basically creates barriers for plants and animals to migrate. The issue of migration rate is another one. Um, it's estimated that within 100 years, uh, climate zones uh, will have shifted north by approximately a thousand kilometers in the northern hemisphere and up in elevation at least a thousand feet. Um, and if you convert that into an 
uh, what kind of migration rate is needed to be able to track that amount of climate change in 100 years, it actually comes down to one meter per hour. And I was actually quite surprised that it was that high when I actually did the arithmetic. Um, and that may sound uh, uh, almost impossible, uh, but it actually isn't. And uh, uh, probably many plants and animals will be able to do that. Um, remember that, for instance, annual plants that uh, re reseed and flower and produce dispersing seeds every year, moving a meter, uh, you know, a, a few hundred meters with dispersal by birds and animals is not that uh, outrageous uh, a rate. Um, a couple of other problems. Uh, there are certain species that are dependent on other species. For instance, certain plant species, especially in the tropics, depend on a particular pollinator species. And so that means that in those cases where there are these interdependencies, both species have to essentially migrate at the same time because neither one can survive without the other. Uh, and then a final problem is uh, exotic invasive species, which is a pervasive problem all over the world. Exotic species are very aggressive, highly dispersible, and so they're going to get to places before other plants, native plants, do in most cases and be established, making it more difficult for native plants to establish. So the next slide uh, just summarizes uh, what species are more at risk, and this is just a uh, sort of easy conclusions to come from, come to, uh, given what I've already told you. First of all, rare species, uh, just because they are rare, uh, because they live in only one to a few locations and have low total numbers are more likely to risk extinction than, than much more plentiful species. Those that have a narrow overall geographic range, um, uh, uh, because they'll, they basically may have to move to areas that they don't occupy at all now, and I have a slide that will show that, uh, a couple of slides in a moment. Poor migration capabilities, I've already mentioned, special habitat requirements, and dependencies on other species also will help identify uh, high-risk species. So this, this uh, will give you an illustration of the difference between narrowly, uh, 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 species that are narrowly distributed and those that are widely distributed. So this is again our cartoon and it shows us, shows the kind of calculation, the kind of, of uh, uh, graphs or plots, maps that we use to show what might happen to different species with climate change. So um, we know quite well the distributions of, of most plants uh, in certainly most parts of the world and, and certainly in, in the United States. Uh, there's a database of over 14,000 species. Um, and so we've uh, arbitrarily picked, or fairly arbitrarily, picked three different species to show you here. One is balsam fir, which is a, a, a very common fir in uh, North, uh, North America and Canada and, and the eastern United States down along the Appalachians and around the Great Lakes and farther north. And you can see that in the sort of lavender color here. And then we picked two narrowly distributed species, uh, giant sequoia here in California and Florida toria which is a conifer in, in uh, northern Florida. And uh, for each of these species, we can define the climate range for precipitation and temperature to which it is adapted. And a species that occurs over a huge latitude and, and, ele and elevational range obviously is adapted to a wide range of temperatures in particular, and probably a fairly wide range in uh, precipitation whereas species that occur over a very short latitudinal range uh, are obviously ad adapted to a fairly normal, uh, a fairly low uh, amount of variation. And so you can map this on a graph like this, and what we call these uh, areas that are colored on this graph is the climate envelope for these different species, which is the climate space, the kind of climate over which it can survive. And so 
we've done that here. And then you project climate change, and this next slide shows the outcome that was done in a very simple analysis based just on temperature for these species. Um, and the climate zones for all three species have shifted farther north. Uh, however, because uh, balsam fir was already so widely distributed, uh, it still occupies much of the area where it uh, occurred before, uh, at least around the northern Great Lakes and the southern part of Canada. If we go back to the previous slide, um, you can, oops, sorry. You can see that uh, it did not occur up all the way around the, the uh, Hudson Bay, whereas um, now it uh, pretty much envelops Hudson Bay, but it's disappeared from this shaded range uh, around the southern ground, uh, Great Lakes and down the Appalachians, so it'll no longer be in the Appalachians. Um, but that doesn't, you know, because it occurs over much of this area already, um, uh, migrating in that way doesn't appear to be a particular problem uh, for that species. But look at the other two species. Their new ranges are completely discontinuous from where they occur now, and they would have to migrate over um, hundreds or even a, a couple thousand miles or more, in the case of giant sequoia, to reach where um, uh, the suitable range for it might be under a new uh, future climate. And so that's why those species uh, would be considered at higher risk than balsam fir. And uh, people are talking about the fact that particularly valued species like uh, giant sequoia, um, uh, that humans would actually probably collect seeds and transport them up to suitable habitats. So uh, in many cases, what we're risking is the loss of valued species, uh, iconic species like coast redwood and giant sequoia in the case of California, because they currently are present, uh, fairly narrowly distributed. The next slide shows uh, some effects on a, a couple of local species. Um, valley oak and blue oak are very common here, at least once you go over the crest uh, of the uh, coast range right here. And what this, uh, this is a kind of funny uh, set of maps. The up, uh, top two maps are for blue oak and the bottom two are for uh, valley oak. And the A and C are one climate projection and the B and D are from another climate model. And the colors, uh, uh, the, the brown color represents areas where these oaks occur now and will also occur in the future. So that you can see there are quite a few areas where uh, they occur now and they'll still be there in the future. The green areas are areas with, where they don't occur now uh, but are likely to in the future. And the light blue areas are areas where they do occur now but will probably uh, uh, disappear from, uh, go locally extinct in those areas. And so you can see the latitudinal pattern uh, in, especially in the green and the blue. So most of the blues are, are down uh, uh, in Southern California, vast areas. Um, uh, you can see at the bottom of these two maps. And uh, there are some areas uh, farther north, probably uh, where elevation changes uh, could be important, uh, where the oak is going up in elevation to stay in a cooler climate. And you can see that most of the green areas are in Northern California where oak would be moving and these oaks would be moving to places where they don't occur presently. So let me talk a little bit about uh, Slow County. Um, I already mentioned the fact that we have extensive variation over very short distances. Um, we have extreme local environmental gradients that are created by uh, uh, changes uh, well, by th th four kinds of, ch of changes. Uh, distance from the coast, elevation, aspect, which is the direction a slope faces, like north facing and south, south facing, and soils. And so these, these, this variation in these things 
over short distances in our county create dramatically different microclimates over very short distances. And you hear about our weathermen on, on the TV talking about microclimates all the time, and that's because they are so extreme. So we can have uh, it be 105 in Paso and Atascadero, and Morro Bay is sitting at 60 degrees, or maybe 70 if it's sunny, um, and uh, also dramatic changes in uh, uh, precipitation regime. So in Cambria, I recorded about 38 inches of rainfall this past rainy season, and from one of my windows, I can see Rocky Butte up at the crest of the uh, uh, coast range, not very far from my house. And there's a, a precipitation gauge up there, and they measured 145 inches. So at least three times what, uh, about four times what I uh, measured at my house. So um, these create habitats for, for species, for plants and animals, and, the, and lots of different kinds of habitats within very short distances. So locally endangered species may be able to su survive, but not by migrating a thousand kilometers to the north, but by moving from a south-facing slope, south-facing slopes tend to be dry and hot, to a north-facing slope just over the top of the ridge, where it's uh, cooler and moister. So uh, here are a few slides. Um, this, I believe, is from Highway 101 before the Cuesta grade, and you can look up on the hillside here and see that uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that you see some conifers up at the very top, and then you can see patches of chaparral, uh, patches of grassland, um, maybe some different kinds of chaparral, and also there are uh, these sort of light brown areas on the uh, uh, sort of medium way up the hills are serpentine outcrops, so there are a bunch of different serpentine outcrops. And uh, this slide shows another uh, example of this heterogeneity or um, uh, dramatic variation in vegetation types over short distances. Um, uh, in, uh, this is actually along Santa Rosa Creek Road. And so a study that was <clears throat> done on plant diversity a, a few years ago concluded that one-third of all species will go extinct if they're unable to move, to migrate to new areas, but that the coast ranges of central California are going to be provide important refuges for species, both locally and also from uh, farther south, um, uh, if they come from areas that aren't as heterogeneous in their uh, topography and things like that, they may be able to find suitable habitats here. So conclusions in terms of vegetation zo uh, zones uh, are listed on this slide. Um, climate change is uh, expected over the next 100 years will cause major shifts in vegetation zones uh, towards the poles by 1,000 kilometers or more and up in elevation by at least 1,000 or more uh, meters, actually, I believe it is. Uh, this, often, uh, this often will change the character of vegetation in economically and aesthetically and recreationally important ways. Uh, fire regimes are likely to change, which will cause further changes in the vegetation. Next slide lists some conclusions for species. Climate change will cause the ranges of most species to shift significantly. Climate change will cause widespread local extinctions, which means they'll disappear from uh, some of the areas where they occur now, but won't disappear from the earth. But in some places, like southern Africa, uh, uh, climate change will cause uh, many global extinctions, complete loss from, from earth. Species may or may not migrate fast enough to keep up with their climatic zones, and humans may have to provide assisted migration, if you want to call it that. We can't predict uh, at, very, at least very reliably, which species will go extinct, but we can identify high-risk groups. Finally, let me just say a little bit about animals, because I haven't said much. Um, it's, a little, it's much harder to say a lot about animals, because uh, climate any, isn't anywhere near as important for at least many species of animals as it is uh, 
uh, in determining their distributions uh, as it is for plants. Um, uh, we know that they uh, are sensitive to climate, uh, but they also have more ways of uh, adapting to it, including being able to move around. But we can expect that there will be significant effects on the ranges and abundances of, of many. Uh, we know that some species already occur over a very wide range of habitats or vegetation types. Take bears, uh, for example, and coyotes and crows, and so they probably won't be affected very much. Others are more narrowly adapted, uh, and examples are uh, a pica. I don't know if you all know what a pica is, but it's a very cute uh, relative of the rabbit that lives above timberline in the Sierra. Uh, and they make a wonderful call, and uh, people like to watch them. Um, and uh, if uh, alpine timberline disappears, then it's likely the pikas will disappear too. The blue-gray gnat catcher is a small bird found only in certain kinds of chaparral in Southern California. And uh, so it could uh, go extinct in many places. Uh, animals that are relatively mobile may be able to migrate uh, with their preferred climate uh, zone and vegetation, uh, uh, but there uh, may be some that can't. So finally, I want to sort of switch gears and tell you about an opportunity that some of you may be interested in. Uh, this slide is labeled Project Budburst, which is the project I want to mention. This is a citizen science project. I don't know if you all know what that means, but basically it's a way that, science, uh, that citizens can participate in real uh, in the data collection for real science project and actually contribute to scientific knowledge. Um, it's a project that anyone can be involved in and the, the objective of this project is to describe changes in the what's called the phenology of plants. The phenology of plants is their seasonal pattern of growth and reproduction. And so basically what you would do if you were going to join this project is pick up a, a plant that is easy for you to observe, uh, say at least weekly. I don't know exactly what they recommend. Um, it could be in your yard or it could be in a place where you like to walk regularly. Um, I think it's most interesting to pick a, a native plant, but I believe uh, that you can also uh, uh, pick a uh, uh, domesticated, a uh, uh, ornamental plant, um, or a fruit tree, for instance, that is on your property, and you uh, watch it during the entire year. And so, uh, uh, as spring approaches, you're going to be watching it for the first leaf buds to appear, and the first small leaves to appear, and uh, describe over time how the leaves grow until they're full grown. And then you describe when flowering happens and, and uh, uh, different stages of the flowering and then uh, development of the fruit and ripening of the fruit and dropping of the fruit, et cetera. Um, and this has been done by uh, thousands of people. Um, uh, it's national in, scope, all 50, national in scope, all 50 states have participants, um, and uh, uh, it's been going on for a number of years now, so they already can show changes in the phenology, and there have been many studies of all sorts of things by individuals or also by a project like this that show that there have been very significant uh, 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 changes in phenology so that many plants are, are uh, uh, leafing out earlier in spring by days that's already been uh, monitored, that it can be even weeks now by, compared with what they did uh, uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And, uh, and so uh, basically what you do is collect the data. It's entirely in, in, internet-based and you submit the data to Project Budburst and all of the data are freely accessible so you can see what uh, other people are measuring on the same plant species that you're looking at. It's 
it's actually quite, uh, from what I understand, a, a lot of fun to do. And so the final slide uh, just shows the uh, website for Project Budburst if you're interested. So uh, that's all I have, and I'm uh, happy to take questions.